Hello everyone and welcome to the 16th episode in the series of things you may have missed in The Witcher 3. I am a few subscribers short since the last April Fool's video, but hopefully I'll make up for it in this one. As before, we're still in Blood and Wine, after 4 episodes there are still things to talk about, and this one may not even be the last. I'd be your best and last. And speaking of previous episodes, if you've missed any of them, feel free to check the playlist down in the description. Where have you gone? Geralt! We've not finished yet! To pay tax? Ah, I expect you to return! Before we proceed, it should be obvious by now, but let me remind you once again that this video will contain humongous spoilers, so be careful. Okay, with that said, let's go over another 10 details you may have missed in Blood and Wine. Starting off with Reginald's great big balls of granite. Somebody stole the testicles off a statue. Some people have been wondering whether carrying them changes anything in any romance scenes. And sadly, as far as I can tell, it does not. But I have a couple of other things you may have missed here. Normally, there are three outcomes. You can take the balls immediately and return them to the curator. You can let the old man have them for another day, which is arguably the best outcome, or let him have them permanently, which is probably the worst one, as he end up dying of exertion. <coughs> However, did you know that there is a fourth outcome? It happens if you choose to fight the cuckolded husband and lose. In that case, he actually crushes the balls. What the love's this? Rosalinta! One, I could forgive you, but two at one time! Calm down or you'll wind up picking your teeth up off the floor. Uh, oh, thank you for nothing. Well, you certainly look the fighter, but that's all. Well, I suppose I must admit it. I stole the stones, but it matters little now. All is lost. What do you mean, lost? While you were out, Rosalinda's husband came after me. Smashed Reginald's testicles to shards and dust, I'm afraid. They're of no use to anyone now. Your work here is done. Now leave me be. Well, have you recovered Reginald's family jewels? Ah, uh, they were destroyed, unfortunately. Destroyed? But... Uh... Nothing I could do, sorry. Fewer children will be born now. Ladies will walk about unsatisfied, their men dejected. Not to mention the sad fate of a certain curator of art and collectibles. <laughs> All is lost. Buck up. You'll figure something out, I'm sure of it. Take care now. Another small thing you may have missed is that if you successfully return them and later choose to stroke them, you get a buff called the Power of Reginald, which gives you unlimited stamina out of combat. So, behold the famous Reginald Dobry. The man with the donkeys. <laughs> Determination. Can't believe I'm actually doing this. Well, go on. Stroke them! You must be jesting. To stroke a stranger, even if it is just a statue. For as a friend, him you would fondle. <laughs> Alright, and while we're on the topic of unfaithful wives, let us move on to number two and the 2-4 monster contract. Mm-hmm. Make sure you address it to customer service. Care Morin, Kedwin. Other than funny lines, there are a couple of details here that you may have missed, both in the ending of the quest. They only become available if you loot Jean-Luc's pendant. Silver pendant. A lock of hair inside. Same color as Madame de Bourbeau's. And with it, you can do one of two things. The first one is to return it to Madame de Bourbeau before turning the quest to her husband. That gives you an extra cutscene with her as well as an extra line in the end of the dialogue with the husband. So, have you... 
Have you found him? Found this. Jean-Luc? Sorry. Really, I am. Lock of hair inside. It's yours, isn't it? Yes. Jean-Luc and I... Well, I'm certain you've pieced it together already. I thank you for your discretion. For avenging him. Please, it's terribly modest, I know, but you must take this reward. My husband is certain to be miserly with his gold. Now, if I may, I'd like to be alone. As for Jean-Luc, afraid he's dead. Sorry. Who? Oh, him. Trivial as losses go. I shall soon find another to take his place. Yeah, as will Madame du Bourbeau, I bet. So long. And the second thing you can do with it is expose her in front of him. This Jean-Luc, he did have a silver pendant. Kept a lock of Madame de Bourbeau's hair in it, matter of fact. What? But how could she? To be unfaithful to me? A lord and heir with a plow-spawned peasant? Oh, she shall pay for this! In that case, after the quest is completed, you can follow the husband, who slowly walks up to his wife and banishes her. You've precisely one hour to pack your things. What? I don't understand. I will not be played for a fool. You know exactly why. Now go, get the to white it! Wolf himself. Which then causes her to run away, and if you chase her as well, you can find her crying over here. I knew this place was no good for me! I'm curious to know which of the two outcomes you prefer. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Okay, moving on to thing you may have missed number three. And we're actually going back with this one, because I forgot to mention something in the previous episodes. The truth is that I made a short video about this some two or three years ago, but it had totally escaped my mind. It is once again about the talking roach quest over here. In the previous video, I mentioned how if you run away from the area, the quest fails, but upon returning, it turns out that roach has actually solved it on his own, or her own. However, there is actually a legitimate way to fail the quest, and it's rather sad, to be honest. It happens if you fail to catch the Umbra while you're chasing it. Yeah, it's right there. Run, roach. What the fuck do you think I'm doing? <sighs> Geralt, we need to get to the Umbra. It gets away now, we'll never see it again, no matter how many doped up slurries you guzzle. Effect of the bruise waning, I can feel it. Won't be able to understand you soon. Ah, shame that. Shame too that we didn't catch that Umbra. But let me tell you one last joke, all right? This is a killer. Why'd the horse cross the road? No idea. <laughs> Phantom you told me about. Still your tormentor? It does. Grants me no rest. Sorry, didn't manage to catch it. And I wasted my stock of Grey Top to make you that brew. I knew from the start it wouldn't work. I fear there's no hope left for me now. Be gone. Go, go. And one more thing, just in case you've missed my video. If you save the game during this part of the quest where you understand Roach and then start a new game plus from that save, you will end up in a state of permanent hallucination. You know, with this purple, partially blurry filter throughout your whole playthrough. Again, I'd lost my memory. Really? Alright, and speaking of exceptional animals, we move on to a detail that is brought to you by a faithful viewer of mine, one who's already made appearances in some of the previous episodes, and that is Gaming Solves My Issues. She told me about a small detail in the quest called Mutual of Beauclair's Wild Kingdom, uh, you know, the one where you decide the fate of Iocast? 
or um, Yokast. Yokast has flown her nest. Which, by the way, if I'm not mistaken, is named after the Greek character who had a relationship with her son. But anyway, you may have missed the fact that after some time, a couple of armed men and a barricade can be seen blocking the road that leads to Iocast's hunting ground. Halt! No passage! No passage! Count de Salveres' orders. The area is closed. A basilisk prowls hey, nearby. A heart overcomes all hindrance. No passage down this way. It's a hunting ground for the beast Count de Salveres protects. The Count also promises compensation for any lives or property lost in the area, just in case. And another thing this young lady mentioned is that the name of the quest is actually a reference to a nature TV show called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And finally, it's worth mentioning that the basilisk is actually not aggressive, at least not towards Geralt, in case you decide to enter anyway. That's all I have for number 4, let's move on to number 5. This one is more like a bunch of small details about Professor Moreau. You know the one from Triss or Yennefer's letter? See what it says here? Postage paid. Won't weasel any coin out of me. Now scram. I knew I should have wiped dirt on that stamp. Bumbotch! You may have missed the fact that in addition to the primary quest that ultimately unlocks the extra mutations, there is actually more to the whole story which can be uncovered through reading notes that are part of the hunt for the Grandmaster gear, uh, specifically the Griffin School. Your Triss. For example, we learn things such as the fact that Jerome himself was the Griffin School Witcher who possessed the diagrams we search for. We also find out that he came here to fulfill a very lucrative contract that was actually a bait placed by his father. The father, Moreau, is also suspiciously referred to as a mage. Now I don't know if that's true, because in all of his logs he never mentions it, if I remember correctly. I wondered whether perhaps he presented himself as a mage to be taken more seriously? I don't know, uh, he certainly was quite the scientist, which is actually not at all unusual for mages of this world. Now in the later notes we find out that he opened a portal to his study with an activation crystal, which he says expired, but he had a spare one. Now does that prove he's a mage? Well, Geralt actually needs to find that spare and use it to open the portal but first he has to charge it with the art sign. So did Moreau charge the initial crystal with his magic? Or were both of the crystals charged to begin with, but simply lost that charge over the decades? But I think it's ultimately more likely that he was a mage because of the final note from Jerome. In there, he mentions recovering from a paralyzing spell. A spell that I can only assume that Moreau himself cast on his son. It's also worth pointing out that there is quite the contrast between the rather positive nature of the notes written by the father and the rather grim ones written by the son. Especially in the very end where he says, Before I die, I want to tell you one thing. You are a madman and always have been. A cruel, cold-blooded murderer. I haven't felt anything for you in a long time. Anything but hate. I'm done with you and I hope you pay for your crimes one day. In addition to that, there doesn't seem to be any further traces of Jerome, so does this perhaps suggest that he was killed by his father in the end? After he ultimately failed to turn him into a normal human? Who knows? It's interesting nevertheless, and I'll be glad to hear what you guys think of it. The time has come to abandon this place. Return home to Lydia. She may yet deign to take me back. The contraption and mutagens I leave here. Let them wither and crumble. As did my dreams of regaining my son. Okay, moving on to something less grim. In detail, you may have missed number six. Here, I have a couple of things about the boot black for you. You remember how I talked about visiting him without boots in one of the earlier episodes? Well, first, it turns out that there's a separate unique scene if you're not wearing boots during the second visit. You know, after the game's ending, if you choose to further investigate the last victim. Need to ask you something. Yet again? Go on then. I'm a proponent of free speech and I will gladly tell you all I know. But why not get your boots shanked while we jabber? 
Not wearing boots just now, but guess I could pull a pair on. Then I shall take advantage as well. A friend of mine used to say boots should be as clean as the souls that wear them. Clean boots, clean souls. A fine slogan. And it's worth mentioning that he also greets you in a different way based on which ending you got, specifically on whether or not you came out of prison. Oh, it's the swordsman. Good to see you. Here for a spiffing? Dirty boots are a stain on professional dignity, you know. Step on up. Need to ask you something. Yet again? Oh, it's the chap with the swords. Sir, you look like some beast ate you up then spat you out. Are you here for a spiffing? Boots make the man, they say. Step on up. Need to ask you something. Yet again? It's a nice touch. Right, for number seven, we have something fairly small, or short, I suppose, because it's actually not small. It's a whale. A whale that falls from the sky at that. It happens in the Land of Thousand Fables during the last stage, you know, after the romance scene, potentially. I only recently discovered that while trying to do something else in here. Anyway, so you just have to walk up to this spot and boom, a whale appears. And there we go. Now, detail number eight is brought to you by another viewer by the name of Sirius Pony. He told me, or she, I suppose, that you can one-shot the Cloud Giant in the exact same manner as Goliath. I've actually recently made a video on how to do it in various ways, but it appears that this giant is also coded in the same way, where if you aim right in the middle of his head, you can indeed one-shot him with your crossbow. However, the trick I showed in the Goliath video with the dodge and shoot does not seem to work here. And also, there doesn't seem to be any achievements associated with one-shotting this guy, unlike the first, but ultimately, it's possible. Alright, we're nearly done, but before we conclude this video, I'd like to take a moment and ask you to give it a like if you've enjoyed it thus far, and perhaps to subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet done so. Also, I would like to say thanks to the people who chose to support me by becoming members of this YouTube channel or through Patreon. Here's to you. Off we go to number 9. This is also something I made a video about a while ago, but never included it in the series. And it's the rather humiliating scene where you get thrown out of the bank. Oh, my... You, sir, are quite the charmer. It can happen in case you refuse to give the banker a week's time to get your money and demand it immediately. Well, actually, it happens if you do that and then lose the fight against his guards. Bugger off, troublemaker! Master Witcher, your coin. Shan't call the guard, but do us a wee favour and never come back. Can do without patrons like you. Your boots could use some polish, Vagrant. It's also worth mentioning that if you get banished from the bank, you can no longer use its exchange services, instead having to turn to this shady dealer over here. Psst. Florence, Orange, Crowns, I've got them all. At preferential rights too. Oh, that's bad luck. How might I help, friend? Do you need to swap currencies, or perhaps a small loan at a reasonable rate? I'd like to change some coin. Naturally. 
How much do you wish to swap? And finally, number 10. For this one, we go to the quest by the name of Till Death Do You Part. Disgusting! <laughs> and specifically, the case where you choose to move Margot's urn away from the crypt. In doing so, you'll have to find her mother's grave. And while you're on that part of the quest, you'll be able to investigate the two nearby gravestones and hear Geralt's reaction to them. The first one is this. Sir Conan of Brayend died of over while witnessing an act of unicorn apositisphelia. Interesting, but not what I'm looking for. Which is most certainly a reference to this clip. <laughs> oh! Wait. For what? We must talk to Krak. No talking! <laughs> What? When are you going to finally burn this piece of junk? Ah! Having sex on a stuffed unicorn! Play, get out of here. Get out! Get out! Man, the the name. <laughs> I must say I'm a little jealous. And there's the second one. Here lies Pablo Diego Jose Francisco de Paula Juan Nepomuceno Maria. Yeah. That's not it. Now this is actually the grave of Picasso. It turns out that that's the first half of his name. And this bit was actually brought to my attention by a member of my Discord server called Mr. Gene 2002 who often criticizes me actually for pinging everyone whenever I post a new video, but I must give credit where credit is due. And with that, I believe we're done. Yet another episode about blood and wine. Ah, to think that I only planned three episodes initially, and here we are preparing for a sixth one. But, uh, you know, that's The Witcher 3 for you. Alright, thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you thought of these details, did you miss any of them, were there any others you wanted me to talk about, or just anything, really, that's on your mind? I'd love to know. And finally, special thanks to Gaming Solves My Issues, Mr. Jean and The Serious Pony for sharing these things with me and helping make this video even better. Until the next one, stay tuned and be good.